Good evening. It is Iran Carr. It is my pleasure to be with you in this evening. And since this is the eve of a minor holiday which you celebrate called Valentine's Day, St. Valentine's Day, but it has really not much relationship to St. Valentine himself, who was a martyr at the time of his leaving the earth. Um, and it is not important. It is that you as a society or as a group have decided that you are dedicating this day or Valentine's Day to love. And you take this occasion to declare your love for one another. Mothers and children exchange little Valentines frequently that say, I love you. Sometimes mother makes special dishes or may buy desserts, pretty pink cupcakes, that sort of thing. Um, as an expression of her love for her family members. Of course, all those who are young and who think they're in love or are in love, that they have uh, this, take this opportunity to demonstrate in some way their loving, loving behaviors and the affection they have for one another. And so I would like to take this opportunity to speak just a little bit about love. Because you may have heard the statement, love makes the world go round. In truth, it was love that manifested this whole creation or God's love for his idea. The idea of all those stars and the comets and the galaxies and the solar systems and life upon planets, that this was all his idea. It was exciting to him to see what he could bring forth. But what does it mean to you when you say, I love you? What are you expressing? You are expressing many different things. A high esteem, perhaps, for someone else. It may not be true love, but it is regard. You have high regard for someone else. You hold them in a special position in your life. Love is concerning itself with other people. It is wishing other people well, hoping that their lives go well. Not seeking to give them love so that they love you back, but an unselfish, sending forth of regard and best wishes for someone else. This is love in every way. Of course, you could love other things that are not uh, living, such as you could love ice cream or chocolate cake or a beer. It really does not matter what you develop an affection for. You want it to be good, and you want it to be in your life. And those two things often go hand in hand, but true love is willing to let go of that which is love if it is for the benefit of the love of the individual's best, what they should receive in the best interest of whoever you are expressing love to. True love allows the object of your love to do what they want to do, to express themselves in the ways that bring them satisfaction, to, for them to know your regard for them, and hopefully, when you are in love with someone, they love you back. And so they have the same regard for you that you have for them. 
they wish the best for you. They would not manipulate you. They would not try to make you be what they want to do or make you do what they want you to do. For true love allows people to be themselves, however they happen to be. Now, this is not to say that because you love someone and that individual in some way may be damaged due to their upbringing or things they have been exposed to, that they may not be kind to you, that they may cause you stress or unhappiness. And even though you love them, it is all right for you to eliminate them from your life. In other words, simply do not speak to them or be with them. If they cause you distress, the love you must have for yourself demands that you take care of yourself first. So any relationship that you have in your life needs to be one which enriches you as well as the other person. Now I know that there are many people who are born into dysfunctional families. They may have a father who is, or a mother who is abusive or aggressive, cause them pain and suffering. And this is a difficult situation because they are parents, your parents perhaps, and they demand or are entitled to some respect and some affection on your part. However, if they have caused you harm and continue to cause you harm, it is in your best interest because you must love yourself. You must take care of yourself. You must give to yourself everything that you need, you must move on or move away, distance yourself from that relationship so that you need not be the subject of their abuse, or the object rather of their abuse. Let them be as they are, but keep your distance. Love and respect them, honor them, but there is no reason for you to be close, for you must honor and respect yourself, take care of yourself, so that you have everything that you need to live a happy life. And so that's my words for this evening. They were a little bit long, but the subject of love is very large, and I addressed as much of it as I could within reason. So let us change the subject, if you wish. And does anyone have any questions for me? <laughs> well, it is time to speak up if you have a question. Um, I, I'm sorry, why is it recommended to do a ritual to help you accomplish something? Rituals call upon power your power or God's power, which are quite the same because God dwells within you and you dwell within God. So when you do a ritual, you are calling your attention to that which you wish to create and manifest in your life. So you are making your actions, your desires, perhaps a little bit stronger within yourself within what's going on. It makes it more important to you if you have a ritual, such as prayer. If you have a shrine, perhaps, um, most people would frown on that. But if you have a picture or a representation that you consider to be Jesus or God or Krishna or one of the other saints, and you wish to increase the power of your desire and what you can accomplish. You can pray before that statue or that image and 
you send out the thought and the desire to create what it is you wish to create. And so that just makes it stronger within you. So that is why it is good, if you wish, to make a ritual about anything that you wish. You wish to bless your baby. You want it to be happy. Your grandchild, your, 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 your baby that you have had. You can hold it in your arms and you can baptize it. You make a, a, a sign of the cross on it and you invoke the spirit to be with this child. And that brings blessings. You can do that for other people. That is just a ritual that increases your faith or your power or the belief in who you are and what you want to accomplish. It proclaims it out into the universe. And when you speak something to the universe, such as your blessing upon your baby, it has an impact. The vibration is there. You have created an environment, hopefully, of love for the baby, or whatever the ceremony is. Certainly, for marriages, ritual is put yourself in front of a, a priest, a minister, or <clears throat> a legal person, and you declare your love for one another and you, you proclaim that love and your devotion and your desire to be one with that other person. And that helps to cement the union. And so I think that is enough examples. I think you can understand why rituals are helpful before starting uh, projects. Uh, yes, I think what you're saying is it makes our, I guess, asking stronger within us. But I'm, as far as the universe is concerned, or or, or God or spirit or whatever, they don't really care, right? I mean, oh, no, we... no, you have missed the point. The ritual also makes an impression upon God or spirit. Oh, okay. It is not, it is for you, but it is also, it creates the atmosphere, what you want to solemnize, to declare that this is so in my life. I am marrying this person because I love this person and I will be with her or I will be with him and we will share life's problems as well as the happiness. And we declare that it makes an impression in the universe. Oh, okay. All right. Anything, anything you think about, anything you do with intention has an effect upon the universe. That is why what you think about is what you attract to yourself. If it had no effect, it wouldn't matter what you thought, but it does matter. Huh. Thinking makes things manifest. Uh, Thinking attracts things to yourself. And so rituals are just an extension of your thinking. And they, and it um, does affect the universe and adds extra power to your thoughts. Okay, thank you. So it is both for you and for the universe. Okay, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Is the world seeing a, an awakening to a spiritual sense? Yes, but this is not a new condition. Within the world, there are always people who are awakening to spirit. 
to the knowledge of spirit or the power of spirit or the power of their thought and the power of their actions, both for good and for evil. And so that is an awakening when you realize that my thoughts, my way of being has an effect upon other people, has an effect upon my world, the world I experience. And so I choose to act with certain ethos which bring about goodness in my life and the lives of those peoples around me because I choose to be aware of or to use the power of spirit within my life. So in a sense, <clears throat> When you say, is the world awakening, it is not something new because there are always people awakening to the power they have and the power of spirit. And I know that many of the uh, people who have, are newly awakened, so to speak, um, believe that this is something new and unique. There are times when groups of people come together who have been recently aware of spiritual life and they choose to see and observe that there is joy and happiness within this awakening that they have experienced. And because they are coming together with other people of like minds who are also coming to understand the power they have within them to create wonderful lives and influence others to create lives that are more spiritually in tune and um, allow them to live in greater happiness, that this is a moment of awakening, that something new is happening. It is just that you, perhaps, are the one that has awakened to these thoughts, these ideas, the knowledge and understanding that metaphysics can give to yourself, to know beyond the reality of earth and what's there, to know that there's more beyond that, that there is God in everything, and that God properly invoked, properly acknowledged within yourself, that God works miracles in creating a beautiful life for yourself as well as for others. And so you are awakened, you are aware, and you now contribute a consciousness to that awakening and bring about more power for that awakening that comes from within yourself to the possible awakening that you give to others through your testimony, through your actions, through your beliefs. Because as I have said before, and others have said it time and time again, what you think about is what you create in your life. So when you awaken to spiritual awareness, you begin to think about spiritual awareness, spirituality manifesting within your life, within your actions. And so you are powerful, adding to that vibration. Wherever you are, you bring it forth and you may benefit others immensely. It is up to you. Is that clear? Do you understand?
I do, thank you. You are most welcome. Are there any other questions? I was wondering, uh, since in spirit, you, well, you don't have to talk uh, uh, because you don't have mouths. Uh, I was just wondering how important is it to have a name in spirit? If you're just kind of openly communicate, you know, there's, you don't have to say hi, Joe, and, and get his attention. You don't have to have a name, but what is the name? A name is really a way of um, addressing or personifying someone else. And so when we're in spirit, and as you say, we don't use words for communication, thought is sufficient. Um, there is always, as in communications, some what of a moment in attracting attention to yourself or your communication. And so, a name can be helpful, but um, names are not that important since most people in spirit have already lived multiple lives um, and have had different names with those incarnations. And so what name do you choose to use? It does not matter. Um, we do not need the names to communicate with one another. We can easily just, um, as we are one in all ways, we must remember that we are not separate from one another. You and I are only separate because you have a body which keeps you separate from me. And I have no body, so therefore, except when I am utilizing the medium's body, so therefore, I must wait until you shed your body, and then we will be more one physically, so to speak, because there is no separation. The bodies are extremely useful. Um, you refer to them as your ego. Your ego has one job in your life, and that is to keep you aware of yourself as you, and to keep you separate from other things so that it individualizes you. It keeps you separate from the person next to you, but you are both already one. But because you have an ego or a mind and a body, that keeps you separate from others. And that is its job, the ego, to protect you and keep you as an individual that is known as Donna. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> so, are there more questions? I have a couple of questions. Yes. They're, they're more of, of my own personal interest and need, is that okay? Uh, they are for your own personal interest and need? Yes, it's yeah. okay. Okay. Um, er, it's, two, it's two parts. And one is sort of a, a comment, sort of, and the other is the question. Um, what you were saying earlier about, you know, not staying in personal relationship with family members who've been or maybe still continue to be um, harmful to yourself. Harmful to myself, yeah. I'm, I'm in the midst of doing that with a sibling because I just thought that enough is enough. It's just, it's enough. Um, even though it's, you know, uh, 
many it decades. Can be, it can be very difficult, I understand, for you, particularly with family members. Yeah. I mean, it feels absolutely right. Like, I just hit, like, stop it. That's enough. Um, um, and what is your question? Well, my question is how to just be okay with that, because a lot of the worst stuff with that sibling was way back when we were kids, but there's too many add-ons still, too many add-ons. It's just not okay. So um, how to be okay with that. And then, you know, uh, the food of trauma can be, the fruit of trauma can be, um, can be, well, just my current situation, regardless of its origins, is that I have a lot of things to solve in my life and I get overwhelmed and just like throw up my hands. Like, it just feels like, I don't know, it's too much. Ah. And also wanting um, work. And then I'll feel like everything feels like too much. Like I can't, even though I used to feel very capable, I'm feeling like I can't do it nowadays. Um, I and, understand your question. Thank I understand you. your question. To address, not the, specifically your questions, but let me talk about that process of letting go. You mentioned that much of uh, what you have gone through happened in the past. The most important thing for you to do um, is that you forgive that which happened to you. I do not know what it is. However, I do know that by your not forgiving, you are keeping those actions and those situations alive within yourself. And that it is to your benefit to let go of these things. And the way to let go is to forgive. So you have to look at your children and whatever it is that makes her taunt you or do things to you that you feel injure you, whatever it is, she has at that time did not have the maturity or the ability to limit that which she did and to treat you fairly. There may have been many things going on within her mind. It was, it was, it was not that, it was a he. It was a he. Quite a bit older, you know, a teenager to my child. It wasn't equal. It does not matter. Whatever he was acting out in his way, what he did to you was harmful to you at perhaps a, an emotional level as well as a physical level. But you have to let go of that. You have to excuse him, if you will, within yourself. You have to say things such as, he was just an arrogant teenager taking, no, care I know what you wanted. taking advantage of his little sister. And he was immature and it made him feel powerful and it was good and him feel good. But he was stupid to do these things to me and cause this rift within me and within him. And I am not going to have him in my life anymore. And I am going to forget that he did these things. I am choosing to forget these, that he did these things. When his actions come to mind, I will say, no, I will not think of these things. I will think about what I want to do. I will think about what I need to do. I will work on my problems. I will not think about my past injuries, 
because I can't do anything about them anymore. Because they were in the past. And all you can do is sever your relationship with him and say, I need not talk to him. I need not invite him to my home. I need not visit him at his home. I need not speak to him in any way at this time in my life. And he is gone from my life forever. And this will perhaps allow you to put some of that childhood trauma behind you because that is the only way to get rid of it is to minimize it and to minimize him in your life as you no longer see him as you no longer uh, talk stop to him. it stop is that something coming from came from bob that was at me i'm so i'm sorry my cat was picking at my <laughs> i thought i was muted i'm sorry well try muting yourself now <laughs> you were yelling at your cat okay so carol um to minimize your relationship with your brother to not have anything to do with him may result in your allowing these thoughts and these memories of what he did to you when you were young, what even he did to you as an adult to fade because you will put him in your past. Now, the practical things that you are speaking about, finding a job, getting things done around the house, I'm assuming, doing things in general, and solving um, sort of problems that require digging into dealing with bureaucracies and stuff. Sort of a I have a I have a panoply of things. Yes. And it is best to just take one. You have a the a, I suspect or I know that you have a tendency to start something and when it becomes a little too complicated, you say, I can't do this right now. And so you go on to something else. And that is the words that you say, I can't do this right now. You need to stop saying that and take one thing and say, I am going to work on this until I get it done whatever that is. Don't allow yourself to try to move to another thing that you think that you will be able to accomplish. Choose the one thing that you want to accomplish more than anything else in the world, whether that's to get a job, whether that's to go through these bureaucracies so that you can eliminate blocks to something that you want to have or that you need to take care of. It does not matter which one you choose, but please choose one and only one. And you must be firm with yourself and say, I will only work on this one. You see, when you get that accomplished, you will feel good. You will feel more competent. You will be confident in your ability to get at least one thing done, whatever it was that you decided. Then you can attack, tackle one more thing and go on and do things one at a time. There may come a point where you feel so good that you might take on more than one at the same time. You start one and you put it in motion and you know that it takes time for anything to be accomplished. And so you let it be for a while and you work on something else. 
And so you use the time factor. How much time does it take to get something accomplished? It's like a doctor appointment these days. If you need to see a doctor, it's probably going to take you three weeks in order to get your appointment. Perhaps not, but there are many people who cannot get an appointment quickly. And so they go to um, a clinic that is open all the time and they get, get to it quickly. But there are times you need to talk to a special doctor or a dentist or these things, and it will take time to get your appointment. So you make the appointment and then you work on something else during that period of time. And this um, can eventually you will have that level of competence that you can do these things. But I ask you to please take one thing and one thing only. Do not allow yourself to be distracted from getting that one thing accomplished. It will make your life easier because once it's accomplished, you have less that you have to do and you'll feel good over your success at accomplishing that one thing. And so that is my suggestion for you that you, um, you, you um, take just one thing at a time so that you can deal with that. And you have to eliminate your brother from your life so that you can feel free to do what you want and you will not be affected by him. Block him from your phone. Do not answer his phone calls. Do not talk to him. And do not let any other family members bring up the subject of him and something that he wants or he needs or whatever it is. You simply tell them, I'm sorry. I'm just not, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not talking about him. I'm not going to help him. I'm not going to hurt him. He simply is not going to have an effect on my life. And I do not want to speak with him. I do not want to speak with you about him. And if you want to continue to discuss him, then um, I may have to distance myself from you. Well, I don't recommend you say that, but that's what you'll have to think about, whether you also need to let go of another relative um, that may contribute to um, the difficulty you have with your brother. Okay, I, I, I have one little follow up. When I pick one thing at a time, thank you deeply already. Um, when I pick one thing to work on and stick with it, sometimes um, the thought of trying to pick one thing can be turn my head into mush, um, like the choosing and the, there's like getting over a fear hump and a choosing confusion. Well, I cannot really help you with getting over a fear hump. You are just going to have to force yourself to choose. And what is important here is that it does not matter what you choose. Okay. You are trying to evaluate what is the best one for you to work on. It doesn't matter. Okay. Maybe thinking about what is the easiest one for me to work on, but it doesn't matter. Just if you want to make a list and uh, close your eyes and point your finger down on your list and see what it says, that will be the one to work on. Okay. Thank you very, very much. You are most welcome. It is my pleasure to be of service. Are there other questions? We have time. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I was wondering, can you explain the different relationship like between us and, and, and the angels and us and our guides and us and the spirits? I, what What's the difference? <laughs> well, that is quite a discussion. It may take up all the rest of the evening. Um, 
but let me try to, to be of assistance here. Um, a guide is, I'm going to put it this way, a deceased person who has crossed over into spirit, perhaps you have had a relationship with this person in your in a previous person. life, um, or perhaps not, it could be just a stranger, who has decided to be of assistance to you so that um, the, um, they will, um, you see in spirit, you can, you can grow, you can get better at things, you can learn things yourself by helping other people who are on earth. In spirit, we do not have problems. So it is difficult to learn and grow. But on earth, there are lots of problems, situations. And by committing myself to be um, with the medium in this case and speaking through her to give advice, um, I, I help others, and in this way, um, you might say that I get credits toward having an easier lifetime next time, or being able to be more successful in another lifetime than I was in the last. So it's to my advantage to dedicate myself to at least some measure of working through the medium to be assistant, assistance to others because that helps me grow. So your guides, and you have several of them mostly, uh, you have um, now between three and five. Um, if you talk to them and you use them, they tend to be more helpful and be with you more than if you ignore them. And so therefore, when you turn to spirit and acknowledge spirit, you begin to develop better relationships with spirit. So you probably have three to five guides that are with you all the time, and they take on different aspects of your life that they wish to help you with. Um, your joy guide just generally tries to help you with all kinds of things, finding lost objects, um, anything you ask of them, uh, they will try to accomplish for you or to help you get it done. Um, they are part of what that thinking about what you want attracts to yourself. They help you to attract things to yourself. They assume that what you are thinking about is what you truly want. So do not think about things that you do not want because they don't, cannot tell the difference. Your thoughts about things are what is, are, are the way in which they are informed of your desires. So you train yourself to think only happy thoughts of what you truly want to have in your life and do not worry to have the best life possible. So that are your guides. The, the joy guide, as I said, tries to help in all different ways. You have a doctor of philosophy who tries to help you with your relationships, your business matters. You have a physical doctor, not a physical doctor, but who tries to help you with the physical body that you have by watching out for its health and um, encouraging you to little whispers in your ear to go to the doctor when you should and to take care of yourself in all ways. And um, he tries to help in that way. And so those are three and you can have also a doctor who, uh, an individual or a guide um, not always calling himself Dr. So-and-so, but who tries to help you with your spiritual matters. And you have um, 
Uh, sometimes he is referred to a big Indian because he is large and strong and he is in charge of keeping you um, safe and your things safe, such as your home or your car. And um, so they are there for you. Now, so that takes care of that term guide. Um, a guide being anyone who is a spirit who is dedicated to helping you or could be dedicated to helping someone else, but they would then, you might not know them. Um, then you ask about what other things besides the guides? Angels. Spirit? Angels. Angels. Ah. Now, angels. Um, Angels are a different type of vibration. Most of them have, they did not incarnate upon Earth or on any other planet as far as I know or any other solar system. Angels in general uh, act as energies, messengers sometimes they are referred to because it is an angel who gave the message to Mary that she would be the mother of God. Um, so sometimes angels act as messengers. They were also forces which helped in the creation. God created them among the first beings um, that he brought into manifestation and they were subject to his desire and helped him with his creation. They are part of him. They are with him. Um, they do his bidding. Um, there are no fallen angels in spite of what the myth says um, because angels are subject to God. And as such, they could not go against God. Um, they are part of him and an extension of him and an extension of his power. So angels are referred to as messengers as well as those who um, uh, helped, especially those you term archangels. They have immense powers and they helped with creation. So that's angels, guides, and what else? Uh, well, again, you were talking about the angels. Uh, people, um, well, people talk to angels or they have some kind of, uh, I guess, communication with angels. Uh, if the angels are not that close to us, what are they doing? <laughs> well, that is the perception of the person on earth who is talking to their guides and thinks they are talking to angels. Oh, okay, that sense. makes more sense. <laughs> Isn't an angel in a sense would be if it was to someone who helped you or did things for you or communicated information to you would be your guide. And the fact that someone on earth utilizes the term angels, learn to talk to your angels for information and help and guidance. It does not matter that they call them angels. Or in a sense, they do help. They are merely spirit. Um, and this is how an individual is interpreting them using the term angels. Okay, now it makes more sense. <laughs> Thank you. And so um, we have a bit of confusion taken care of. Is there any other? Uh, only a slight one um, in the spirit sense that when our loved ones pass or whatever, that we, we talk to them. Um, not always sure they're talking to us, but we think they are. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> I mean, it's hard to decipher whether you're just thinking about them or they're actually you know, putting some uh, thought in your head to say, I'm here, or, and do they also like step in as guides too, or, or what's the deal there? <laughs> um, those people that you have had great affection and love with, 
your parents, other family members, perhaps good friends who have uh, transitioned into spirit, they still can remain connected to you on the physical plane, even though they have ventured into spirit. And I understand that it is, there is no way that you can guarantee that that which you are hearing in your head or in your mind is actually the voice or the thought of the loved one that you have or talking to. And I realize this is difficult. Um, in all probability, as long as the thought is helpful, as long as it makes you feel good, accept it as coming from whomever you think it is coming from. If for some reason you are getting strange thoughts in your head, or I will say devilish thoughts, or thoughts that are not helpful to you, but perhaps may cause you fear or pain or suffering, then you have to reject those thoughts as being either some, some part of yourself that is coming up with these things, or you have inadvertently um, gotten in contact with um, a spirit that is, you, you might call a devil, um, a spirit that is not working in your best interest. And so then you have to be very careful with what you are listening to. Um, I assume that it's not happening to you. So you are can accept the messages if they are helpful, if they are comforting, just accept them as coming from the person who has passed. Is that, so is that kind of like our, our guides using um, our connection to these people in order to try to tell us something? No, it would not usually be your guide using your love for uh, someone who's transitioned into spirit to tell you something. Your guide will probably tell you something and it'd be just a thought that pops into your head. Oh, okay. All righty. You are most welcome. Thank you. Is there any way else I can be of assistance? Any other questions? I have one. Yes. <laughs> um, so it's about crystal necklaces. So I've been wearing crystal necklaces for probably about two years. And I wore like five different ones. And 2022 happened to be a very traumatizing year for me, especially last summer was like the worst summer of my entire life. Um, the necklaces got so, I guess, like contaminated with like negativity. I understand. And they all shattered and I tried cleansing them and there was actual pure red from these necklaces and we had to get rid of them. So we buried them okay. and um, I kept my evil eye necklace because that one did not shatter, but I kept it outside on my deck in salt. And I recently took it in the house probably about four days ago since July. And I bought new necklaces like a chakra necklace, an amethyst, a selenite. And they've just been sitting here. And I'm iffy on putting them on. Like, because such bad stuff happened. I don't know if it was just all the negative energy that built up into those necklaces. And now I feel naked without them. So I got new ones, which I'm sure they're um positive since they were not worn or anything yet but i'm still having doubts on if i should 
put the new ones on and if everything's going to be okay or if I put them on is like bad stuff going to start to happen again well these are fresh necklaces they were not part of yourself during this bad time and your necklaces may or may not have had anything to do with the bad time that you were having it was um it was um uh, you know, your cat and your uncle, and there were various things going on in your life, but these did not necessarily have anything having come from your necklaces. Now your necklaces may have absorbed your vibration and those vibrations around you. So it was good that you took them off and you sought to clean them and they didn't clean properly to your satisfaction. I didn't quite understand what you were saying. They, about them being red, but um, they were not cleaning up to your satisfaction, so you buried them. Now you have new necklaces, and whatever is going on in your life at this time is better, is it not? Yes. So these necklaces would not have absorbed any of those vibrations because life is better now. So it is safe for you to wear those necklaces. If you are worried about them, you can always put them you know, outside again in the sunlight, cleanse them, make a cleansing prayer over them, and then put them on. But they have not been, I'm going to say contaminated by the previous things that were happening because they were not in your home. Okay. With you. So you can wear them now if you wish. Awesome. Because I've been dying to wear them. <laughs> I just needed that okay that I could put them on. Because yes. I don't want to put them on. And then, God forbid, something happens. And I say, oh my God, was it because of those necklaces? You so. see, that is your habit of having negative thoughts that we have discussed in the past. And you have to recognize that. That type of thought is something that is habitual for you. It bears no reality. No, uh, it's not part of reality for you. But it is what you think about. And so it is not good to think these thoughts. You need to cancel these thoughts and say, I'm not thinking possible bad things. I am only thinking probable good things. This is a good thing. I'm going to wear these beautiful new necklaces. I'm going to feel beautiful. I'm going to feel protected. These necklaces will protect me. And that is the reality you want to generate in your life. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Try to remember this. I will. I want to ask one more thing. I have my dental cleaning on Thursday and I always get anxiety going to the dentist. I've never had a cavity or anything in my life. Like I've always had really good teeth. I brush my teeth like five times a day. Um, my upper tooth has been very sensitive lately. I don't know if it's from like whitening toothpaste or whatever. But in my head, it's, oh my God, what if there's a cavity? What if they have to pull the tooth out? So do you think that everything's going to be okay Thursday? Like it's just something simple. It's just an irritated gum. <laughs> it could be an irritated gum. I am no dentist, so I cannot possibly <laughs> answer that. However, I am sure if you have gotten a cavity, that it would not mean your tooth needs to be pulled. It simply needs that you need that cavity filled. You need it repaired so that, Does that it hurt? causes you a problem. Does that hurt? Because I've never had like um, any type of like drilling or anything done. Like I've only had Invisalign to straighten my teeth, but I've never had like any work done on my teeth. So I fear like, oh my God, is it is it going to be painful? Am I going to be screaming? Like, well, I prepare myself. I cannot for guarantee. I cannot guarantee you what it was or it will be painful or not. 
But if it is painful, the dentist can give you an injection and it will make uh, you numb and not experience any pain while he is fixing the tooth. If you are worried, you can ask to have that done. And the dentist will probably give you his opinion on whether it is truly necessary or not, but you can insist on it. I'm just hoping it's irritated gum because it's just like been bleeding. I'm sure. I don't think cavities bleed. Oh, no, they do not. Okay. And so it is very much to, to be an irritated gum. I believe <laughs> one of the solutions for irritated gums within your mouth is to rinse your mouth with salt water and to oh. swish it around and keep it there. And that, that often can, is helpful to irritated gums, but your dentist will be able to advise you on Thursday. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're most welcome. Are there any more questions? Well, now it seems very quiet. And as it is about 10 minutes to nine, um, I think I will say good night. And so I give you all my blessings. Good night. Good night. Hi, I'm back. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed your evening. It was, it was um, I think, a good one. And um, um, I hope that you all come again. And uh, remember, I love you all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay.